welcome to the Vin Armani Show. We are streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. Also on Twitter and Periscope at Vin Armani is my handle there. And of course, we're also streaming live on the Facebook page of our content partner, Activist Post. So that's facebook.com slash Activist Post. Well, it's 10 a.m. Monday morning, and we are coming to you from fabulous and now starting to get very hot Las Vegas, Nevada. Have a great show for you today. Very excited. My guest is a guest that we've had on the show before, but we're welcoming him back. It's been it's been a while since we've had him on, and it was such a great conversation last time that I'm I'm glad that he's back. That's the creator and host of the Survival Podcast, Jack Spierko. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Also, we've got uh, interesting had an interesting week. We are, if we can get to it, going to talk about. Uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which I think had a breakout week just in terms of mind share. Uh, hopefully we can get into that. We've got two other stories that are going to take up quite a bit of time because we're going to do a deep dive into Manchester and the Manchester bombing. And we're going to also talk about the Portland train stabbing. Both of these considered, or the narrative associated with them, is that they are, in a sense, politically or ideologically motivated attacks pulled off by extremists. We're going to get into that. We're going to dig into the narrative in a way that's a little bit different, but hey, that's what we always do. And to help me with that digging is my good friend, co-host and producer, Mr. Christian Reyes. Christian, good morning. Good morning, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, we, we got Jack Spierko coming back on the show. Yeah, that's going to be great. You that's know, awesome. it's uh, the last time we had him on, we talked about his podcast. Uh, we talked about prepping. Mm -hmm. But today I want to talk with him more about principles. So he and I, you know, he and I talk every once in a while and we had discussed the fact that, you know, we are, although our lives are different in many ways, yeah. the principles that we sort of use to organize our lives are very similar. And I think that especially in this environment where people are really the, the creation of the other is such a big deal. Yeah. And on, on what people think are political stands, but which are really aesthetic preferences, that talking about principles is really important. So I'm happy to have Jack on. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, this, this is going to take a while mm. to get into this Manchester thing. I want to I do this. You know, I was on Wednesday. I was on um, Alt News, Lift the Veil with Nathan Stoltman. Mm. I, I think you, you saw that. People can yeah. go and check it out. Just, just Google uh, Alt News, Vin Armani. You know, he does the whole conspiracy thing theory thing. Right. Uh, we've had Nathan on before when we were talking mm -hmm. about the Russian ambath ambassador, ambassador, the <laughs> Russian ambassador uh, getting shot. That really weird situation in Turkey where the Turkish police, former police officer right. shot yeah, yeah. the Russian ambassador. Mm -hmm. And we analyzed the video and there were some weird things to it. So he had done some things on the Manchester bombing. I went on, there were some, there were some weird issues with the bombing at that point. But one of the things that we discussed on that show, and it's, I, I want to dig into this Manchester bombing in, with a little bit of a different angle, mm -hmm. right? I think that certainly in the liberty community, and I think it's because you have, I mean, you've got people like Alex Jones, right. you know, you have, you know, even James Corbett to a certain degree. We're looking for conspiracies, right? Mm -hmm. Since 9-11, since that whole thing, we've known and, and people have looked further at the fact that, oh, here's these false flags, mm -hmm. here's these hoaxes. And the question really is, is everything that we think a false flag or a hoax, or is it just that we're seeing that the narrative that we're being presented has a lot of holes in it? Right. Right, and I actually watched the the Lift the Veil show right. when you were on there, and I had to watch it twice just because it was the the perspective that you're putting out there is so it's a different perspective, and it's so good because it's like it's just facts, you know. So I even had to bring my girlfriend and say, "You got to watch this because this is a totally different perspective." You hear a lot of the same Appreciate conspiracy st stuff all the time, and this is just the cold hard facts and 
deep diving into each part. So I was like, this is really, really great. Well, here's the thing. It's, it's what is Occam's razor? It's something like when you eliminate the impossible, whatever's left, however improbable yeah. is mm -hmm. the truth, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with automatically assuming everything is a hoax, for instance, right? Assuming, oh, this is all staged, no one died, is that then what you do is you go down this rabbit hole of trying to prove like it's inductive logic, right. lo uh, reasoning. Mm -hmm. You're trying to, you start out with a premise and then you only look at the things to try to prove your premise, right? Right. As opposed to the idea that like, no, let's look at actually the things that we can see and let's derive something out of that. Because what happens is you start to look at those things and as you gather the data, you start to see inconsistencies in the data. Mm -hmm. When you start to look to prove a pre uh, your hypothesis from the beginning mm -hmm. and you exclude everything that doesn't prove your hypothesis, well, you naturally exclude inconsistencies, but the inconsistencies are the most important part. Mm -hmm. And in terms of understanding the narrative that you're being presented, a lot of this, this is sort of like inside of me on a very deep level from having been on reality TV right. for a long time mm -hmm. and realizing, look, Things don't have to be scripted. Things don't have to be staged. You can just allow things to happen, but you can edit a narrative, right? So how I started the, the show sort of to give some background, and I think this will help people who are watching yeah, this to sort of frame this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. The Shining, right? The book by Stephen King, the movie, a Stanley Kubrick masterpiece, star, stars Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, fucking frightening, <laughs> right? Considered, considered one of the masterpieces of, of terror mm -hmm. of all times, right? Scary movie. But if you have enough raw footage, you can edit a narrative to look like just about anything you want. So mm -hmm. The Shining, super scary movie, but with enough footage, you get something like this. Why don't you uh, go ahead and show the people this? Meet Jack Torrance. I'm outlining a new writing project. He's a writer looking for inspiration. Lots of ideas. No good ones. Meet Danny. He's a kid looking for a dad. There's hardly anybody to play with around here. Nah. What's up, Doc? Jack just can't finish his book. I don't want to sound melodramatic, but there's no way to make it economically feasible. Here's to five miserable months. But now, sometimes, what we need the most is just around the corner. I'm your new foster father. I do anything. Climbing up on Salisbury Hill. I love it. I could see the city light. My heart going boom, boom, boom. Son, he said, grab your things. I'm going to take you home. Shiny. So there we go. The Shining as a feel-good family film. <laughs> That's great. Now, The Shining wasn't written as mm -hmm. a feel-good family film. The Shining wasn't scripted as a feel-good family film. It wasn't shot as a feel-good family film. Mm -hmm. It wasn't filmed as a feel-good family film. But there's The Shining in trailer form, in soundbite form, as a feel-good family film. Crazy. Okay, so, you know, we throughout the time that this show has been on, mm -hmm. right, we're in 30 weeks now or 31 right. weeks, something like that. Mm -hmm. We've constantly, I've, I've tried, it's, I've really tried to show that the real problem with the media, the real problem that we have is that the media has turned into a bureaucracy mm -hmm. where they're looking for the easy story, the easy soundbite, because you don't make more money by being the best out there. You go in, 
You've got your certain article you have to write. You've got your certain piece that you've got to produce. There's all of these people. They just want to produce the piece and get it done. Produce the piece and get it done. And they'll take whatever kind of works, slam it together. And a lot of the time, it's straight up wrong. Yeah. But if it makes a good story, if it's shining, and they look and they're like, that's a pretty good trailer. That works. Put it out. So, I went into some things on Lift the Veil. People can go into that. But I want to go into, this is our first, our first news story here. The, the, the real question that I had from the, the entire time at, is that the story that's being fed in this case, it, it does not even reflect reality. And I think that's one of the biggest problems is that we've reached a state now where I think we're really able to separate ourselves and say, these people are the other, and therefore the laws of human nature that I understand as apply to me don't apply to them. From the beginning, from the beginning, when this thing first happened, like Tuesday, 9.30 in the morning, you've got this, uh, this tweet. This, of course, we'll start with a little Vince Stradamus. Here was my question, and you keep this question in mind as we look through just a few of the inconsistencies of Manchester, but some that no one else is bringing up, and I don't understand why. Here was my question. A terrorist organization has a willing suicide bomber and a bomb inside the UK and waste both on an Ariana Grande concert. As this thread sort of went on, I said, look, they've got a willing suicide bomber, a bomb, and I guess probably a bomb maker, if this is a homemade bomb, and you waste it on an Ariana Grande concert, and you only do one. That seems very inconsistent in terms of human nature. And so then, the inconsistencies begin. Now, interestingly, I'm just looking at the inconsistencies that are actually there, that I can actually see, not reading into anything, not inventing anything. One of the interesting things that I saw from the beginning of, of this story, almost the first day that it was big news, Google News is top news, on Google News there was this. Christian, you got this Google News thing? So you've got the story, Hunt for Manchester bombing, blah, blah, blah. Mixed in, the whole time they had this little thing. Fact check. Was the Manchester terror attack a false flag? Snopes, on, from Snopes. This was sitting within the rest of them for days. I'd never seen anything like this before. I'd never seen a situation where clearly there was enough chatter around of people saying false flag to where Snopes decided they're going to do a th So let's, let's run the Snopes article here. Let's show this. Was the Manchester terror attack a false flag? A viral conspiracy video has emerged spreading a false rumor that a suicide bombing attack at, the, at an Ariana Grande concert was a hoax. And this is one of the places where you, you mess yourself up. If you're looking to say, what we're being told is not the truth. Because... The person who comes out and says, well, this is all a hoax. None of, this, none of this actually happened. Nobody died. It was just fake dye packs. Like all of that, that's so easily disproved. And then, boom. So you're almost creating the straw man where they're like, oh, no, no, no. The people who said it was a hoax, that it didn't happen, well, all you got to show is one dead person. All you got to show is one credible eyewitness, and you've just had your thing, but your little fantasy world of things didn't happen blown apart. So that's not very... Then that basically takes the official narrative and elevates it. So let's, let's take a look at this, though. Let's take a look at the official narrative, right? New York Times. Let me just read this to you. And this is very... It's just this first May 27th, right? You see the picture of the vigil? This is New York Times. In other words, this is the, the Western world's narrative. This is written by three people, right? Three authors on this, not just one person. Headline, forgive me. 
Manchester Bombers' Tangled Path of Conflict and Rebellion. This is them telling the story of the Manchester bombing. Manchester, England. Solomon Abedi was wearing a red vest, his suicide bomb hidden in a small backpack, when he phoned his younger brother in Libya and asked him to put his mother on the line. It was about 10.20 p.m. on Monday, and the call was short. How are you doing, Mom? Please forgive me for anything I did wrong, he said, and hung up. Okay. There's very few things in this, but it's important. One, the very first words they say, Solomon Abedi was wearing a red vest. Two, what else do we know? We know both his brother and his mother live in Libya. It also turns out that his father lives in Libya. Okay, let's just start there. Now, where did the New York Times get the information that he was wearing a red vest? Well, let's go to the Evening Standard. So, Manchester bombing. Mom who miraculously survived massacre saw killer blow himself up in a huge flash of light. A mother who miraculously survived the Manchester terror attack has described the horrific moment she watched the suicide bomber blow himself up in a huge flash of light, quote, Emma Johnson, 47, who was 10 feet away, so remember this, she, according to the Evening Standard, she was 10 feet away, from killer Solomon Abadie as he detonated the bomb, said she saw a flash before victims were sent flying across the floor. Manchester-born terrorist Abadie murdered 22 people, many of whom were children, in the suicide attack outside an Ariana Grande concert on Monday night as happy crowds left the Manchester arena. Ms. Johnson told the Sun. Remember that. Ms. Johnson told the Sun, quote, I saw a person in a red vest with a gray panel by the merchandising stalls. On the front of his top, he had what appeared to be a large raised zipper, the width of his chest. So you see right there, Ms. Johnson told the Sun, and then they link to the Sun article. Quote. Now, quotes mean this is what the person said. I saw a person in a red vest with a gray panel by the merchandising stalls. Well, that's what the New York Times says, too. So let's see what The Sun says, The Sun article that, where they said that Ms. Johnson told this to The Sun. Face to face with a killer. Mum saw a Manchester Arena suicide bomber just seconds before deadly terror attack and claims terrorists stood out because of risen bits under the clothes. A woman believes she saw the suicide bomber just seconds before the deadly blast at the Manchester Arena and claims the terrorists stood out because of the risen bits under his clothes. Emma Johnson had gone, uh, had gone to collect her daughter, 15, and son, 17, from the concert and was waiting in the foyer when a lone attacker detonated a nail bomb, killing 22 people and injuring 59. The mom from Preston described seeing a person in an intense red-colored top among the sea of teens dressed in Ariana-themed pink, white, and black clothes in the moments before the blast. She told BBC Radio 5 Live, hold on, I thought she told The Sun, but here's the son saying they are reporting what, they, what she told BBC Radio 5 Live. Quote, I was about 15 feet away from the blast. Hold on. <laughs> Didn't the Evening Standard just say? Can we go back to the Evening Standard? Emma Johnson, 47, who was 10 feet away. And Emma Johnson told The Sun, I saw a person in a red vest with a gray panel. Now go back to The Sun. Emma Johnson, she told BBC Radio 5 Live, I was about 15 feet away from the, the blast. We were waiting for our children to come out and we stood at the top of the foyer. You go up some stairs and we were protected by glass on a barrier. So, I don't really understand how you can be a reporter Read an article, link to an article, get the distance wrong when it's written down, get the sourcing wrong, and then, so go back to Evening Standard. Miss Johnson told The Sun, I saw a person in a red vest with a gray panel by the merchandising stalls. Well, I think just to see what this mother actually said, 
Because clearly, whoever wrote this Fran Francesca Gillett, and this is what I'm talking about, about the problem with the bureaucracy of the mainstream media, is that they can't get it right. Let's actually hear what this woman said. Now remember, the Evening Standard says I, that she said, I saw a man in a red vest. Let's see if she actually said those words. Let's go to her interview. You can judge for yourself. I was about 15 feet away from the blast. We were waiting for our children to come out. And we'd stood at the top of the foyer. You go up some stairs and we were protected by glass on a barrier. As the doors all opened, it was just before the end of Dangerous Woman's song. It hadn't quite finished and obviously people are leaving to miss the traffic. So we said we'd stand up there so the children could see us. Um, and as people were coming out, people were wearing the clothes of the colours of Ariana, you know, the white, the black, the pinks, because they'd all sold the merchandise, etc. But for one split second, I turned and saw, as only as I can describe, as a bright red, that's why it stood out, it was a bright red, with a grey panel down the front, with like, just, just, written bits all over it and it was that that stood out because it was so intense the colour in, in in this this crowds of people as quick as I saw it the explosion happened and it was from the Victoria station side and then it happened near um, where they sold all the merchandise uh, uh, there were dead bodies everywhere there were and then I saw the torso, uh, the remains of her body left as well. It was horrendous. Well, you're talking very well, uh, and, you, and you're, you're making p perfect sense. Um, and how is, how is your daughter, how is your son? Okay, under the circumstances, very grateful to be alive, I think. Um, as they were in the, the arena, they had no idea what had gone on at the first time until they heard, they heard, as you've seen on the TV, you can hear the explosion, but that was nothing in comparison to what it was in the foyer, because obviously your ears, it was just so loud, and then you just saw this flash of light, and then there was just smoke, and there was shrapnel everywhere, everywhere. The glass exploded, it was just people screaming, um, so your instinct is, my children, my children, I've got to get to my children, I've got to get to my children. You see, they knew that they couldn't get into the arena because obviously there's security guards on every single door, but there's no security guards stopping people coming into the fire. So anybody can walk in at the end of the night. So it just happened so quickly. It was the moment I saw it and then the explosion happened. I just, I just can't comprehend. It just seems so, it just seems so surreal. I just, I, my, my heart goes out to all those that have lost loved ones. I rang last night because there was reports of it was a balloon going off. It was a speaker exploded, and I had to tell the story for all those that had lost loved ones that it wasn't, it was an explosion, and it, it was. I think a suicide bomber. I, I, that's mine. <laughs> well, that is more or less, that's more or less been confirmed, Emma. Mm. Uh, that's what I said to them uh, last night, I thought, before these, these results came out, because I, I, I saw, I saw, I, it just, because it, it stood out within everybody, within seeing it in a split second, the explosion happened. Well, everything you saw is going to be very useful to the police. And uh, yeah. have you got in touch with the police? I've tried. I can't, I can't get through. I keep trying. I keep trying. Do you, do you, do you have the anti-terrorist hotline number? I've got it here for you. We can give it to you off the air, but yeah. it, I'll give it to you on the air. Yeah, yeah. I have one number, so, yeah, I'll, I'll compare with what you've got. Yeah, that's great, please, if you will. And I'll ring them as soon as I can. For anyone else, it's 0800-789-321. 800 Three, two, one. You can actually call 999 as well. Right, okay. Um, so, dude, here we've got a situation where here's an eyewitness, right? Mm -hmm. Eyewitness. S sounds to me and seems to me very credible, right? right? She 
has already spoken with somebody at the BBC. This was the second interview they did with her. She, the police have not reached out to her. It's crazy. Now, she says that she looked over, she saw a red vest, someone in a red... I think, the, I think vest cuts out in the interview. Yeah. I think she's saying red vest. With some red with a gray panel down the front with risen parts all around it. Okay. This at least seems to me to be an angle that you might want to walk down, mm -hmm. right? You might want to, there's closed circuit cameras everywhere in the UK, yeah. especially the big cities, everywhere. And it's like a, a problem. Big arena. There, like we, and we know that there are closed circuit mm -hmm. television. And the media is reporting he was wearing a red vest until all of a sudden they're not reporting that he's wearing a red vest. So everything you've seen so far, red vest, red vest, red mm -hmm. vest. Red vest is credible, right? Totally credible. There's a reason why the media would report that. It's the first words of the New York Times story, as a matter of fact. Salman Abedi was wearing a red vest. Well, until you might actually have to go and look on the closed circuit TV cameras for someone wearing a red vest, because all of a sudden the sun says, Nah, we've got pictures of him. We know what he was wearing, so here's the sun. Minutes from mass murder, suicide bomber Salman Abedi caught on closed circuit TV in the lift to Manchester Arena wearing $300 Nike trainers with his hand on the trigger of a homemade device moments before killing 22 innocent concert goers. So, bomber Salman Abedi looks relaxed in a lift. That's an elevator, for those who don't know. Minutes before detonating the homemade device, which killed 22 people at the Manchester Arena. So, the Manchester police say have released some pictures to the Sun. This is on 27th May. Updated on the 28th of May. So here we go. Let's look at these pictures. Now, something you might notice about the apparel of young Salman Abedi. That is not a red vest. Let's go to the next picture that they have. Also not a red vest. Another thing that you might notice, this is supposedly where it is. This is the elevator that takes you to the arena. So this is the night of, this is moments before, supposedly he's got his hand on the detonator. Go back to the pictures, Christian, because there's something that we might want to note about these pictures. Uh, Christian, as a uh, graphics designer, <laughs> as somebody who is used to using Photoshop. Is there anything uh, a little bit disconcerting to you or <laughs> anything that sticks out about these photos? And mind you, these are the photos that the Manchester Police Department released. Is there anything curious about this? Yeah, this looks like a five-year-old Photoshop. <laughs> go back Go back to the one before that, the first one. Yeah. Somebody just took the black paint tool went around him and then did black paint and not yeah. even a really great job at it. Mm -hmm. Now, for why, why would you do that? It's really strange. But what would be the, what would be the motivation? Like, why would you black out certain areas? Think of a scenario where that would happen. Like, why would you do that? Let's say, let's say there was a picture of you. Well, yeah, so they cut them out, obviously, but they wanted to hide what was behind him. Aha. Aha. Mm -hmm. Now, what's supposedly in that picture should be the elevator mm -hmm. to the Manchester Arena. Right. Now, if perhaps, as we said, there are closed-circuit cameras everywhere in the UK... And if perhaps you maybe caught Salman Abedi, oh, maybe three weeks ago, mm -hmm. waiting for a bus in another neighborhood and definitely not standing in an elevator. Exactly. Or not standing in that elevator, might you perhaps, hmm, I don't know, <laughs> black out the fucking background so no one could tell where he was? And yet... Go back to the go back to that the, the the sun black vest uh article here go back to that no problem they have no problem this is i took those are the those are the pictures from the sun article they have absolutely no problem with this 
They have no problem being handed photos where the Manchester police says, oh yeah, this is definitely inside the elevator. And, and they have no problem posting these it's crazy. with this kind of Photoshop cutout. Like, yo, this is... <laughs> I mean, you're not even fucking trying. Yeah. <laughs> like, you didn't even go take a picture of the elevator mm -hmm. and try to, like, fit him in there. Yeah. If he's standing in the elevator on the way up, why would you not show the whole thing? If there are people who's in there whose faces you don't want to show, blur their faces. On other photos, they've got photos of the dead bodies laying on the ground and they pixelate the dead mm -hmm. bodies. The Sun does the same newspaper. Why are they not demanding, where, give us the whole photo, right. or we're not going to print this, or we're going to question why these things, did anybody question? No. Absolutely not. Do, you, do I need to bring up some crazy hoax conspiracy theory to say there's a fucking huge problem here no mm -mm. no it's pretty clear the questions it's like the questions are there so mm -hmm. here's another question right so this dude the question so go back to the uh, initial question that i had the question that i had was and what i said from the beginning not a lone bomber definitely an organization willing suicide bomber a bomb and a bomb maker in the beginning, they're like, and now the story that comes out is they're saying, oh, no, he was the bomb maker and the suicide bomber. <laughs> and he was pretty smart. <laughs> and and he learned he the other thing that's and, and we'll get into this, but everybody who's an expert on explosives has said, and I said this in the uh, in the lift the veil interview, and I said this from the beginning to kill 20 people with a man portable explosive device is a hell of an explosive device. Mm -hmm. It's a military grade, professionally done. It's not something that you just whip together off instructions off the internet. This is something you have to be trained for. Now, counterterrorism experts have been interviewed around the world on this. They've all agreed on this point. Now the story is Salman Abedi is associated with some group and he's the bomb maker and he learned how to make these bombs somewhere. He must have spent, they're like, he must have spent weeks or months mm -hmm. in a war zone like Syria, learning from someone on the battlefield how to do this and becoming a bomb maker. It should be really easy to figure out if he traveled to these places. Yeah. So we're gonna look at the bomb and the travel now. Let's look at the facts. So the first thing is this thing. This landlord arrested. So they're saying that terrorist Salman Abadi rented a 12th floor flat in a block of flats in the Blackley area of Manchester for seven weeks. This is Daily Mail. The high rise block was raided by police on Wednesday after a tip off from landlord Ayman Al Wafi, who was arrested. So this guy was like, I think the bomb maker was making bombs here. They raided the, the flat and then they arrested the landlord. That's interesting. Salman Abadi, 22, is thought to have stockpiled peroxide at his cousin's barbershop in Mossside, Manchester. In the early hours of Saturday morning, another two men, aged 22 and 20, were arrested in Cheatham Hill. Around 9 a.m., an area of Mossside was evacuated as police searched the property with a bomb squad attending. So, let's now go and look at this flat, this Blackley, Blackley flat. Let's take a look at this. This is from The Independent. New details have emerged about the Manchester flat in which the 22-year-old terrorist Salman Abedi carefully constructed his bomb. The landlord, now remember, they're saying this is the flat where he constructed his bomb. This one, Blackley. Manchester flat in Blackley. The landlord of the property is said to have told friends that the flat smelled of chemicals and contained what he now believes were pieces of bomb-making equipment. Abedi is also said to have used a pen to cross out children's stickers that had been stuck to the wall, believing they were not compatible with the teachings of Islam. Bedclothes for more than one person were found at the flat, and a younger man is said to have been with Abedi when the rental was agreed. Landlord Ayman al-Wafi was, quote, in tears when he realized his tenant had carried out the deadly attack, a friend, Mohammed al-Hudari, told the BBC. Quote, he was shocked and in a bad situation, he said. 
said, very upset. There were tears coming from his eyes. Mr. El Wafi is said to have informed police immediately after realizing the connection, despite having breached the terms of his own tenancy by subletting the flat to Abadi. Mr. El Hudari said Abadi had responded to an advert in early March, saying he wanted to rent the property for two months. The terrorist told the landlord he was a student and worked as a delivery driver at night. Mr. El Wafi is said to have received a late night call from Abadi around six weeks ago, saying he would be, quote, flying abroad and no longer needed the flat. It is believed the 22 year old flew to Libya where his parents and two of his three siblings live. Mr. El Wafi headed straight to the flat after receiving the call, but said Abadi had already left. At the property, the landlord discovered squares of cut up curtain like material, a metal rod in the bath, and a chemical smell. The electricity had been turned off and a smoke alarm disconnected, Mr. El Hudari claimed. Mr. El Wafi did not report it to police because it did not occur to him that it could have been related to terrorism. Quote, we didn't even think 1% he was a terrorist or a bomb maker, Mr. El Hudari said. We thought he must have been a drug dealer or doing witchcraft. There are now three properties believed to have been used by Abadi to make his bomb. In addition to the Blackley flat, police are also reporting to have discovered extensive bomb making materials at the Abadi home in Fallowfield, South Manchester, prompting fears that other explosive devices could have been made. ABC News reported that investigators had found a huge load of unused chemicals at the house. Okay, so here we get a timeline. Supposedly, Christian, this guy goes and he rents this flat for, he says for, he wants it for two months, right? Six weeks ago, he says he has to go to Libya. Or he calls and says he's, he needs to go to Libya. Okay. So for six weeks, he hasn't been in this particular apartment. Now, six weeks ago, the landlord goes in, looks around, shit's all fucked up. There's a weird chemical smell. Things have been cut up. There's some stickers crossed out on the wall. The fire alarms have been unplugged, supposedly. Now, Reports in the media says that this block of flats is really shit, right? Really shit. Hmm. Anyway, he doesn't report it to the police. Why? Young Muslim man, clearly not terrorism. He's either a drug dealer or he's practicing <laughs> witchcraft. <laughs> Much higher chance of witchcraft than, than terrorism. terrorism. So something with this guy Who's, who is Muslim? This guy's apartment is trashed by a young Muslim kid. He himself is Muslim. He doesn't think it could be terrorism. Whatever hmm. Salman Abadi was doing, if he was in that apartment, whatever he was doing didn't click off to this guy that it could be terrorism that it could be bomb making. Mm -hmm. He just reported it after and then was arrested. That's interesting. Yeah. He reports it six, week late, six weeks later and they arrest him. So when they talk about the arrest total on this thing, he's included in that, the landlord who reported. Okay, so now you saw in that that they said that there were three apartments. Yeah. Now at the beginning of this, remember at the beginning of this article, they said that was the apartment where he, that he used to assemble his bomb. He hasn't been in that apartment for six weeks. They later say that in the same article. Again, this is the mainstream media as horrible as they yeah. could possibly be. It's just a terrible bureaucracy. There's no editing taking place whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Or the editors are so bad because they've risen to the level of their own incompetence. Basically, if you can't write for shit, you get to become an editor, <laughs> right? Okay, so then the second place location involved is this Granby, this flat in this Manchester area called Granby. So let's talk about this Granby flat. Okay. This is from the Independent, Salman Abadi, inside the rented flat where Manchester bomber is believed to have spent his last hours. So this dude is supposedly going around renting second apartments. Pictures have emerged showing the flat where Manchester bomber Salman Abadi is believed to have spent his final hours before carrying out his deadly attack. The rented property in Granby Row, central Manchester, could be where the 22-year-old prepared the explosive used in a suicide attack at an Ariana Grande concert at Manchester Arena that killed 22 people and injured 64. The terrorist was reportedly at the flat, which is less than two miles from the arena, until 7 p.m. on Monday night, just three and a half hours before he blew himself up in the venue's foyer. The one-bedroom property was rented out on a short-term basis for $75 a night or 300, uh, 75 pounds a night or 355 pounds a week and is said to be owned by a local couple. 
Police and military personnel believed to be SAS soldiers raided the flat on Wednesday morning using explosives to blow off the door in order to disable any potential booby trap left by Abadi or his accomplices. A similar tactic was used to gain entry to the Abadi family's home on Ellsmore Road, South Manchester, on Tuesday. Neighbors reported a large number of packages being delivered to the Granby Row flat in recent weeks, while others are said to have noticed a strong smell of explosives coming from behind the door in the days prior to the attack. So, Here's this other location where supposedly there's a strong smell of explosives. So how do we gain entry? I know. Let's blow the doors off the hinges <laughs> with explosives. We suspect there are explosives <laughs> in this apartment. Let's use, expl let me repeat again. Let's gain entry with explosives. Jesus. No problem there. <laughs> Absolutely no problem with that narrative. Totally safe. Totally, totally <laughs> copacetic. Yeah. That's exactly what the bomb squad does when they fear that there might be explosives. <laughs> they blow, they use explosives to blow the door off hinges. Wow. In an apartment block, in an apartment. That's what they do. Again, media. No, 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 no need to question that. <laughs> totally fucking fine. Okay. So, this guy is renting apartments to build bombs. Now, why would you rent an apartment? You have a home. Mm -hmm. Why would you rent an apartment to build your bombs? It's, very, it's not a trick question. It's very simple. Hmm. If you have a home, so let's say it's you, right? Yeah. yeah. You have a home. You, if we find out you rented an apartment, you were building bombs in that apartment. Why were you not building bombs at your house? Because you don't want to blow up. <laughs> right. Now you, well, you don't want to blow up your house. your house. Well, there's many reasons. Yeah. Because you, the you reason for caught. renting the apartment <laughs> It's because you don't want to build the bombs at your house. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Right. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Right. It's such an easy and simple question that it's like, it's almost dumb to ask, yeah, right? Yeah. Like where it's like, yeah, why are you renting an apartment? Well, because I don't want to build the bombs at my fucking house, right? right. Like that's the answer. It's so very simple. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, let's then look at what's the third location. Let's look at the Abadi home. So this is from the Telegraph. Manchester attack. Fears over second bomb after police find huge chemical explosive cache in Salman Abadi raid. The Manchester suicide bomber may have built a second device, which is now in the hands of fellow jihadists, police fear. Officers who raided the home of Salman Abadi discovered a working bomb factory with a huge stash of explosive chemicals and other components. Security sources now believe that Abadi assembled the bomb himself after learning his trade in Libya. But the amount of material in his home has led to fears that he could have built more than one device and distributed them to other British base extremists. A security source told The Telegraph, the worry is there was enough to build two or three bombs and we can't rule that out. Abadi arrived back in Manchester from Libya on Thursday, traveling via Istanbul and Dusseldorf. The following day, he visited the Arndale Shopping Center in Manchester, where he was caught on CCTV buying a Caramore rucksack. It is believed he then spent the weekend putting together the main components of the device, including the detonator. On Monday, he then traveled the three miles from his home in Ellsmore Road in the Fallowfield District to a rented apartment in Granby Row on the edge of Manchester's gay village. The building was raided by special forces at lunchtime on Wednesday, and special forensics teams and bomb squad operatives were still at the building on Thursday. The use of two addresses to assemble the device was a tactic used by the 7-7 bombers, who also spent months learning how to build a bomb at a training camp in Pakistan. Former Metropolitan Police Officer David Vitisette, who helped investigate the two bombings, said it was likely Abadi had spent many months abroad practicing how to assemble a device before returning to the UK. He said, this is not something you can just put together by reading a book or watching a YouTube video. He will have spent time in a camp somewhere, 
possibly in Libya, being shown how to do it. But once you have the skills and the materials, assembling the device itself can be done fairly quickly. On Thursday night, the search for his Islamic network was continuing, with a total of eight people being questioned on suspicion of involvement in what officers described as significant arrest. However, fears that a bomb maker was on the loose were played down. U.S. media outlet reported security sources in America as saying that, no, that officers no longer believe that to be the case. It appears, uh, it appears officers now believe a Beatty is the bomb maker and may have built more bombs, which have yet to be discovered. Okay, what do we see in this story? In this story, they say he, had, he would have spent several months, perhaps in Libya, learning how to do this. Mm -hmm. Fucking problem. Problem with the timeline. Because he was in the Blackley apartment, supposedly building bombs, and then he went to Libya. Right. Six weeks okay. ago. Yeah, gotcha. So he couldn't have learned right. how to build. If he's building the bombs in Blackley before six weeks ago, he didn't learn it six weeks ago. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. And supposedly he just got back from Libya, which they know when he traveled. This is not hard to track down. Why is this information not forthcoming? So then when did he travel to somewhere else? When did he learn to do this? Mm -hmm. Can you show us the travel? When did he travel? If they're saying he could not have learned this except by being in a camp in Syria or Libya, or because they're saying he didn't learn it in the UK because there's not a bomb maker on the loose in the UK, who would have been the one to teach him? They're saying there's no bomb maker in the UK. A baby is the bomb maker. A baby learned it mm -hmm. in Syria or Libya. Mm -hmm. When, 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 when? He's a 22 year old kid. He, if he travel, he's traveling, he's got a passport. It's not like tracking down his travel is hard. Just show me the gap. Yep. Just show me the gap and show me where he traveled. Just show me. The media, no request for that. Mm -mm. None mainstream media. Already their narrative's all fucked up. But you know what? They can't even see it. They can't even see it. I, yeah, literally, so I don't think that it's a conspiracy. I just think they don't fucking care. Right. They just, they just want to put out something that's going to get some views. They want to put out a, the story that they need to put out today. Yeah. Who cares if it changes tomorrow? They never retract anything. Mm -hmm. They never, none of, all of these articles are still up as of yesterday. The Red Vest, all those Red Vest articles are still up. No retraction on, oh, actually now we know, oh, oh he was wearing a black vest. So mm -hmm. no, nothing, no change. Same newspaper. Hmm with competing with mutually exclusive facts. So let's just go a little further on this. Then here's this interesting thing. You dig back, because what you want is source material. Let's look at the suitcase story. This is fucking weird. <laughs> so this is from the Sunday Times, okay? The suicide bomber who murdered 22 people at a concert in Manchester had recently returned from Libya. We established that. It emerged last night as Britain was put on alert for another imminent attack. Thousands of troops are set to be deployed at high-risk locations as part of Operation Temporary after the threat level was raised from severe to critical for the first time in a decade. Police and intelligence agencies are trying to establish whether Salman Abedi, the Manchester bomber, had received terrorist training at a jihadist camp in Libya, where Islamic State and Al-Qaeda have allied to fight government forces. A school friend told the Times that Abedi a Manchester-born, university dropout of Libyan descent, had returned in the past week. He went to Libya three weeks ago and came back like days ago. So here we go. We know his travel. Three weeks, he's been gone for three weeks. They said he would have needed to spend months in a camp. Does he have a good reason to go to Libya? His mother, father, and siblings live in Libya. Shit. Now, here's what's interesting. 
same article. Abatey 22 was known to the security services who will now face questions about what steps were taken to monitor his activity after his return to Manchester. On Monday evening, he placed a suitcase on the ground in the foyer of the Manchester Arena moments before it detonated, according to CCTV footage recovered by detectives. The b blast sent shrapnel flying into the crowds as they left the concert by the U.S. pop star Ariana Grande, killing an eight-year-old girl and other children and leaving 59 injured. Security sources say that their number one priority was working out who made the device. It was difficult to believe that Abatey could have carried out his attack using a sophisticated bomb without, sophistic without significant support, they believe. Wait a minute. Accor according to CCTV footage recovered by detectives, he placed a suitcase on the ground in front of the foyer. According to the CCTV footage of this attack, someone places a suitcase on the ground and the suitcase explodes. Now, could you possibly ever, would you ever describe a backpack, a rucksack, as a suitcase? As a suitcase? Hmm. In the supposed CCTV footage, uh, no, the CCTV, it's not footage. It's just those two photos that are photoshopped. He has a backpack mm -hmm. on his back. Would you ever use the term suitcase to describe a backpack? And especially if you were a detective, a police detective, would you describe a backpack as a suitcase? Clearly. Where is the suitcase? Who was carrying the suitcase? Mm -hmm. Who was wearing red? Is it possible that the person seen wearing a red vest was also the person carrying the suitcase that's on the CCTV <laughs> footage that no one is showing anybody? Why are the photos that are being shown by the Manchester police, what is photoshopped in the background? Yeah. Wow. When did Salman Abedi travel to a camp and was gone out of Manchester long enough that he could have learned to make such a bomb? If he was making bombs in his house, why was he renting other flats? Why? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you've got a full bomb factory in your house, why are you renting other places? Especially if you're going to do a suicide bombing. This is so, not making yeah. anything up. This is not searching for a hoax. No. This is just, here's the facts. <laughs> that are, the facts exactly. as they're being reported are fucked. Mm -hmm. Are fucked. So? Crazy. What is it, but what does this look like to me? What does this look like to me? And what's another fact of how these terrorist attacks really happen? And while we're doing this, why don't you tell Jack that we'll have him, uh, we'll connect him about you may not get to the other story. We'll connect him about 11.05, tell him. Cool. But in the meantime, throw up this uh, FBI plots thing. This is from the Kansas City, City Star. This is a story that some people are aware of. This is something that's, that's going on. I'll let the Kansas City Star tell it themselves. This is what's been going on in America when they say we've, that the, uh, Homeland Security or the FBI has foiled terrorist plots. This is what's really going on. This is from March of this year. Announcements. It says FBI undercover stings foil terrorist plots, but often plots of the agency's own making. Announcements of foiled terrorist plots make for lurid reading. Schemes to carry out a President's Day jihadist attack on a, a train station in Kansas City. Bomb a September 11th memorial event. Blow up a thousand pound bomb at Fort Riley. Detonate a weapon of mass destruction at a Wichita airport. The failed plans all show imagination. But how much of it was real? Often not much, according to a review of several recent terrorism cases investigated by the FBI in Kansas and Missouri. The most sensational plots invoking the name of the Islamic State, or Al-Qaeda here, were largely the invention of FBI agents carrying out elaborate sting operations on individuals identified through social media as being potentially dangerous. In fact, in terrorism investigations in Wichita, at Fort Riley, and last week in Kansas City, the alleged terrorists reportedly were unknowingly following the directions of undercover FBI agents who supplied fake bombs and came up with key elements of the plans. 
What I get concerned about, quote, this is a quote, what I get concerned about is where the plot is being hatched by the FBI, said Michael German, a fellow at Brennan Center for Justice and a former FBI agent. There has been a clear effort to manufacture plots. Law enforcement has increasingly used undercover agents and informants to develop such cases in recent years, especially against people suspected of being inspired by the Islamic State. Of 126 Islamic State-related cases prosecuted by federal authorities across the country since 2014, nearly two-thirds involved undercover agents or informants, according to the Center on National Security at the Fordham University School of Law in New York. The FBI has stepped up its use of sting operations, which were once seen as a tactic of last resort. FBI officials have said the sting operations are just one tool for thwarting terrorist attacks and that the suspects in such cases are given many opportunities to back out before their arrest. Federal authorities Authorities employ the stings on the theory that a person willing to engage in terrorism would eventually find real accomplices to carry out an attack. Such cases are almost never successfully challenged in court with entrapment defenses. But some question whether the FBI is catching real terrorists or tricking troubled individuals into volunteering for a long prison sentence. The most recent alleged plotter, 25-year-old Robert Lorenzo Hester Jr. of Columbia, was indicted last week after federal prosecutors accused him of participating in an Islamic State plan to cause mass casualties in a bombing attack on a train station and possibly buses and trains in Kansas City on February 20th. The two men leading Hester in the alleged plot were uh, actually undercover FBI employees. They suggested the time, place, and type of attack and loaned Hester $20 to buy the 9-volt batteries, duct tape, roofing nails, and copper wire that they implied would be ingredients for a bomb. Hester reportedly failed to buy the copper wire, saying he could not find it. There were no actual bombs. The FBI employees had identified Hester as a suspect after seeing Facebook posts he made about his conversion to Islam, his hatred for the United States, and his belief that the supposed U.S. mistreatment of Muslims had to be put to an end, according to court documents. But despite Hester's denials, the FBI employees noted he continued to test positive for marijuana, even though it is frowned upon by Islamic teachings, and he allegedly found it necessary to bring his children to a meeting with the FBI workers because he had no other options for child care. At a December meeting, one of the FBI employees threatened Hester with a knife, saying he knew where Hester and his family lived to make the point that Hester was not to plan any attacks of his own. Quote, it seems like outrageous conduct, said German, the former FBI agent, who noted other aspects of the investigation that he thought seemed, quote, odd. So Christian, we know for a fact that here in the U.S., FBI agents are monitoring potential terrorist threats mm -hmm. and are fabricating. So since 2014, we've got the numbers here. Since 2014, they said two thirds of 126 Islamic State related cases. So two thirds of 126 is basically like a little over 80. 80, it's, it's actually 82. Since 2014, the FBI has hatched 82 fake plots. Wow. Fake terrorist plots where they've pretended to be terrorists, reached out to people who were troubled individuals, as they say, mm -hmm. to try to bring them in on terrorist plots, giving them money, giving them equipment. Now, what do we know about the Manchester bombing? Oh, MI5 was looking at him. And now, comes out today, MI5 mm -hmm. is actually going to investigate themselves. Interesting for why didn't we do anything? We were, we were monitoring this guy, why didn't we do anything? Well, maybe you did do something. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe there was someone with a red vest. Maybe there was someone with a suitcase bomb. Maybe Salman Abedi had no idea about them. Right. Maybe Salman Abedi thought he was doing something completely different. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wasn't making bombs. Maybe there were just chemicals. Maybe these chemicals had been given to him by MI5 agents who were doing the same thing that the FBI does because these all police forces share tactics and information. Uh -huh. You think if the FBI is doing something that MI5 isn't doing it? Mm -hmm. You think if the FBI is using a tactic that, the, that MI5 is not using a tactic? Get real. Yeah. <laughs> Get fucking real. They have joint terrorism task forces right. that have conferences and meetings and share information about how they're doing things. And then you say, well, what would be the purpose? What would be the purpose? Mm -hmm.
Why would you do this? Well, they did take the threat level to critical. They put troops on the streets. Now buried in the news was the fact that Theresa May, after doing that, oh, she went to the G7 meeting. You got this G7 story? Manchester attack has G7 demanding internet giants crack down on extremist content. The G7 nations on Friday demanded action from internet providers and social media firms against extremist content online, vowing to step up their fight against terrorism after this week's Manchester attack. Prime, British Prime Minister Theresa May won solidarity from her G7 colleagues at summit talks in Italy after the suicide bombing Monday at a pop concert killed 22 people, including sev several children. The G7 also vowed a collective effort to track down and prosecute foreign fighters dispersing from conflicts such as Syria, which May said showed the morphing nature of the threat. As they, quote, as they lose ground in Iraq and Syria, foreign fighters are returning and the group's hateful ideology is spreading online, May said. Make no mistake, the fight is moving from the battlefield to the internet. So yet again, as wow. we talk about the crypto savages, as I, yep. as I, quote, as I, as I coined last week, the idea that those we are being targeted Mm -hmm. Those of us who are actually pursuing truth, those of us who are actually questioning the official narrative, who are saying that the state of things and the state itself has gotten pathological, and we're looking, f we're looking forward at the other technologies, at cryptocurrencies, at independent media. We are... We are <laughs> based on the internet. This new culture that's coming is about the new internet. It's about taking right. away centralized power. It's about decentralizing it. And so to get back to my question of, if a terrorist organization, let's take the word terrorist out. Take the word terrorist out. Mm -hmm. If an organization, the question that I asked at the beginning of the week, if an organization has a willing bomber and bomb in the UK, why would they waste it on an Ariana Grande concert? Well, let's take waste out. If an organization has a willing bomber and a bomb, and they bomb an Ariana Grande concert, what should you think about that organization? If I'm looking and I see, here's an Ariana Grande concert, mm -hmm. the target is the hearts and minds of the average person. The target is not the UK government. The target is not another religion. Mm -hmm. The target is not a political individual. The target is average everyday people. The object is to make average everyday people scared scared for their children Fear. who are alone on the internet. Mm -hmm. And who are they watching? Ariana Grande. That's it. And so, to me, that doesn't sound like the actions of a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a propaganda play. Right. That sounds like softening the public up. And it did. They got soldiers on the streets, and she got an agreement to crack down on the internet. Wow. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That is the shining as the real horror movie that it is. Right. That's it. Really interesting. It's uh there's a lot a lot beyond that too. And you can also look at like just any any of the stories that they put out, not just the big ones, but also any story, and it's going to come down to the way that they frame it. Uh, every time. Mm -hmm. I mean, those, that's great. I advise anybody to go. If, you, if, you, if you're looking for that Shining, and it, people should share it, and they yeah. should start talking. It's called the Shining Recut, but one of the things is that when you go on that, you're going to see Willy Wonka cut as a horror film. You're going to see uh -huh. Dumb and Dumber cut like Inception. Right. Like, there's tons of these That's crazy so what you have to remember is that you're always seeing the trailer mm -hmm. and even if the trailer is not completely deceptive even if the trailer doesn't completely 
switch the plot around like what we showed with The Shining, it still is just a trailer. Mm -hmm. There are huge elements of a plot, of a movie plot, that are necessarily missing from a trailer. And how many times have we seen a trailer that made the movie look amazing and the movie was shit? Exactly, yeah. Actually, so remember, yeah. you're always seeing the equivalent of a trailer. Every news story is the equivalent of a trailer. Mm -hmm. Nathan Stoltman put out something really great, too, recently. Uh, after the thing that he did with yeah. you, he also did another breakdown, and there was one thing where he was wrong. Mm -hmm. And he noticed that the, the episode that he was wrong on got, like, crazy views. Yeah. Crazy views. And like probably got shared quite a bit. Uh -huh. Hundreds of thousands. Because here's the thing. People want, and this is the danger, right? Mm -hmm. The danger is people want something that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And the reason they want something that's exciting is because they want to be able to make that jump. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to make that leap in logic. Because moving through it rationally, not good. Right. Also... One of the important things about, yeah. about these fantastic ideas, these ideas that there's this crazy hand, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's doing all of this, and not just a bureaucracy basically being owned by someone who knows what the fuck they're doing, mm -hmm. like a little tiny small act, and then knowing that, okay, that's mm -hmm. going to make this, 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 this happen, because this is just how the fucking media works. Right. This is how we get our way. Well... People don't buy Louis Vuitton based off a logical decision. There you go. <laughs> that people are not logical. Yeah. But you, what you have to remember is that the media are people too. Mm -hmm. And very, very few of them. Look, one of the reasons why we do, we, we do the news this way is because we're not being paid a, a salary, right. a monthly salary. Yeah. The second you get paid a monthly salary, well, then you automatically, we all know this, you do as little work as possible mm -hmm. to keep your job. Yeah. There's no reason to do any more. Mm -hmm. If you keep your job doing next to no work, especially in a, mm -hmm. in a business that's, it's not like a startup where if you do more work, the business may actually succeed and you have some stake. But if you're in a longstanding bureaucracy, if you're working at the New York Times, you don't make a fucking difference. No one cares if you're there or not. So long as you meet your deadline and so long as nobody kicks it back at you like this is bullshit, it goes through. And we see that because you had Judith exactly. Miller who was exactly. putting out fake stories for fucking years at the New York Times <laughs> and didn't get caught. Mm -hmm. So this, I mean, this is very so, important, but it's also what it's about. And I guess we'll be, we're close to getting to, to Jack. We should probably get to him, but it does go to our guest, Jack Spierko, because self-sufficiency is not just in growing your own food, defending mm -hmm. your home, you know, whatever. Self-sufficiency is also self-sufficiency in, in gaining your own knowledge mm -hmm. to understand the narrative for yourself. And I think that that's something that separates our culture, the, 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 the crypto savages, those people who are being looked at now. And I wish that we could get to these other stories. Maybe we can. I, we'll, we'll see. I, I think we'll probably have a long interview with Jack, but uh, maybe we'll do them next week. But I think that what's just emerging more and more and more is that th there is really this old culture that is that really believes all that shit and you see an emerging new culture that questions it i would just hope that through the things that we do that we'll be able to sort of help people to refine mm -hmm. their methodology right right and not immediately go off on some crazy fantasy tangent let's let's start in a well, world where we can actually also operate. going back to nathan too he came out with another episode right after that and he said i was wrong on this and mm. actually we learned a lot from being wrong because we watched what youtube did and stuff like that now if the media came out and said, hey, we were wrong on this thing, and... Then somebody gets fired, that's the problem. Yeah. But Nathan can't fire himself. Exactly, which is cool. <laughs> that's the power of it. That's yeah. why I say, when you're working a salary, <laughs> the whole, we know this, the whole dynamic changes. It changes, yeah. It changes. It changes. So it's, it's a kind of a combination of that social pressure and laziness at the same time. It's exactly what, it's mm -hmm. human nature. Yeah. <laughs> right? At the end of the day, it's human nature. And I think mm -hmm. that understanding free markets understanding economics, mm -hmm. it's all about human nature. It's why the, the, the ideas, things like Austrian economics, it's why it's so powerful on so many levels. Mm -hmm. Human action, it's very, very powerful. Well, let's take a break. 
Uh, go ahead and bring Jack on during, during the break, and then um, when we're back, we'll do an interview with him. I'm, I'm sure this is going to be good. We're going to get into some principles of uh, voluntarism, freedom, liberty. Let's do it, man. Welcome back to the Vin Armani Show. We are streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. We are also on Twitter and Periscope at Vin Armani is my handle there. Uh, in addition, we are, of course, streaming live on the Facebook page of our wonderful content partner, Activist Post. That's facebook.com slash Activist Post. Before we get to our guest, I just want to talk to you a little bit about our newsletter, Counter Markets. So, countermarkets.com, trends and strategies for maximum freedom. We are very excited about the new issue that's coming out. It'll be out on June 5th for all those of you who have subscribed already, and thank you for that. I know that you're getting wonderful content every month. We're glad to have you on as subscribers. For those of you who have not read this newsletter yet, you can get your first issue for free. And so basically you could get the May issue right now and then if you subscribe, you'll get from June all the way through, as well as with your subscription, the back issues and access to our Facebook groups, kind of like a mastermind group. So what are we covering? Well, we are covering, and maybe we'll get to some cryptocurrency stories today, but we are covering this new rising economy, this new way of thinking which in many ways is a renaissance to older ways of thinking, but it's about self-sufficiency, decentralization, what is coming in the future. So we're covering everything from, of course, cryptocurrency, surviving in this new world of automation. We talk about the content business quite a bit, since that's something that we're in. Precious metals. We've done quite a bit on uh, backyard gardening, 3D printing. I think you kind of get the idea. A lot of the things that our guest coming up uh, has a, a great expertise in. We're going to be talking about that and some other things. So while you're watching or while you're listening in the background, head on over to countermarkets.com, get your first issue for free. And now I'd like to bring on our guest for this week, Jack Spierko. Jack Spierko is the creator and host of the Survival Podcast, a daily online audio show about self-sufficiency and self-reliance in the modern world. Jack conceived and created this podcast because over the years he's come to realize how fragile the human condition and the United States economy really is. His five-day-a-week show, the Survival Podcast, is about managing his homestead in Texas, practical prepping, permaculture, and self-reliance. It receives a remarkable 150,000 downloads per day. Jack Spierko so welcome back to the Vin Armani Show. Vin, thanks for having me back. Uh, greetings, my fellow crypto savage. <laughs> there you go. I, I, I really, you know, I, when I came up with that term, I figured at some point soon, the sort of old culture is going to try to name us. They're going to try to attach a label to what we are. And unfortunately, right now, the labels that I'm seeing thrown around, although I do consider myself an anarchist, although I do use the term, in the mainstream media, it's being used to describe sort of a broad range of people, and I feel like it's maybe not in our best interest to be grouped into all of those people, right? And with the cryptocurrency people, like it's, it's, they're really associating it so much with hackers and cyber criminals and all of that. So, I well, do... and they're associating with the kids that are out there with the the masks, there you so go. they look like a badass, but it's really so that their parents don't ground them. <laughs> <laughs> They're not supposed to be out of the house. Well, yeah. I mean, it, 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 and it is, that is a, an, a very interesting part, uh, point that if you truly believe in what it is that you're doing and you believe that you're right, like you and I, we're standing here, there's no masks over our faces and, yeah. and we're very open about the way that we live our lives. And th that's what I wanted to, to talk with you about the last time we had you on. And it was a great show. I advise everybody to go back and, and check it out. Super educational, super informative. We talked about you know, the ideas behind self-sufficiency, a little bit about prepping. You, you said some things that I've repeated quite a few times since that interview in January that really woke me up. 
What I wanted to talk to you about today is I think it, I think it is getting at this idea of what, is the, uh, what are the underlying principles of this other culture? Because politically, you and I, we talk about, you know, we identify ourselves as either voluntarists or anarchists. We certainly don't see a need for the state, but I think a lot of that comes from the fact that we feel like we can take care of ourselves, right? And that those two kind of go hand in hand, right? When, when yeah. did... I don't know if we I don't know if we've talked about this fully. When did the, when did that idea hit you or what was the associated idea? Because I think for me, it's not really about the state. For me, it's about taking care of myself and having the freedom to do that. How does that how does that combine for you in terms of the things that you do every day? Well, I mean, so kind of taking it back to the genesis of the show, um, at the time I started doing the podcast nine years ago, I was a libertarian as in an LP type libertarian, mm -hmm. right? Libertarian party member, um, which I don't consider myself anymore. But even at that stage, my view was always, well, if we say we don't need the government to do all the things we say don't, we don't need government to do, then someone has to be responsible for that, and that someone would be us. And I think a lot of people that are even to the uh, right side of the political spectrum, they like that verbiage, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily live that in their daily lives. So when you say, well, you think we should be responsible for ourselves? Well, yeah, okay, so you know, how long can you go without another paycheck? How long can you go if the power's off to your house? How long can you feed your family if uh, something goes wrong and you just don't, don't worry about the apocalypse, you just don't have money for the next two months? Are you, is your family gonna eat outside of the, the, the social, uh, they call it a safety net, I call it a, a hammock, right? <laughs> because, well no, like a safety net is like this guy's like flying by his ass from a trapeze, Right, and uh, if he falls, he could still break a leg or something, but it keeps him from hitting the ground. Right, and then he gets his ass out of the the trapeze net and gets back up there and goes back to doing what he's doing, unless he's hurt too bad and he goes and does something else. Where that's a safety net, like our political system has created a hammock. So once you land your ass in there, there's absolutely positively no reason to get out of there. Mm. And you see a lot of people that. I mean, I know one guy that, you know, he, he fancies himself kind of this uh, small government conservative, and he, he texted me one day, you know, years ago, and said he was retired now. And he's fairly young, so I'm like, how are you retired? He's like, I got hurt in a month of disability. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's not, not retired. retired. So, so to me, it's kind of always been self-evident. I mean, I grew up in the mountains of Pennsylvania. Uh, my father was a bootleg coal miner, so that's agorism. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if anybody knows what bootleg coal miner means, it means you're doing all the work, you're keeping all the money, but it's not your land you're pulling the coal out right, of. Right. Um, I come from a long line of things like that, and I guess we just always took care of ourselves because uh, it's the old, if you're familiar with the art of not being governed, mm -hmm. and uh, the book, and the concept of you have the people that live in the cities that are down in, in, the, in the plains, and then you've got the hill people, and the hill people have always been very distrusting of government and very self-sufficient. We were hill people. Hill people. I guess I call them hillbillies mm -hmm. now, but uh, I, I don't know. Now I'm in Texas. We don't have hillbillies here. There's no hills. Right. It's flat. Completely flat. flat. It's flat. <laughs> so, and, and I think, you know, that, that does reflect um, – that, that certainly reflects – my sort of family background. I mean, I'm from, I'm basically, I'm from this desert. So the Mojave, you know what I mean? I've, I've, my, and my family's four generations in San Bernardino County, which from Vegas, you can almost see it. It's state line, right? So this, this is basically where, you know, my, the patriarch of, on both sides, for, you know, four generations. So it's like, it was, it was not a very forgiving place to be at the time that my, my grandparents were, were there and I you know my grandfather was a gunsmith and he went out and and he hunted and sometimes that's how they ate he's known for running down like jackrabbits as a kid in the middle of the desert I think when you when you come from and it's probably why Vegas Vegas people and Nevada people tend to be very um very libertarian as well because when you're from a, a and the, I mean the hills are unforgiving you know things yep. go wrong for you up there and like it's it's curtains like nobody's coming to help you and the same thing is if you're stuck out in the desert you know you got to rely on yourself and yeah, I, it's I, not like reality tv where there's a cameraman right. eating food a sandwich while you're supposedly lost right you actually are lost or you are hurt or you're all stuck somewhere and, and you just have to be prepared to deal with it so the the metaphor then i think because i think that it 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 provides a good outlook for for people is you know you, you discuss a hammock but the question is like if you're at least the high wire guy, he's doing his thing. If he doesn't fall, 
And there are people who work without a net, right? The really good yep. ones get to work without a net. But without the hammock, like once you're in that hammock, the, I feel like that's the real, both mentally, spiritually, and physically. Now you're really dependent. Now bad things could really, really happen as if something goes wrong with that hammock, which of course you didn't build, you have no control over. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, you get, yeah. you're getting what I'm saying? And it's like, I think, uh, uh, not to scare people, but approaching it from, from the reverse a little bit, you know, we've, I wanna talk with you about the idea of these, I don't know what you would call them. They used to call them library libertarians or lounge chair libertarians, but these people who, who spout these principles but clearly can't take care of themselves. Um, but I, what, I, what I want to talk about is that move, and have you seen that move of people taking on the sort of idea of, I'm going to be self-sufficient, I'm going to be able to take care of myself, and then you seeing their politics move? Because I assume that a lot of your listeners uh, probably, you know, being rural individuals, being in, interested in cer the certain aesthetic preferences, probably a lot of them come to you as pretty conservative status, right? Uh, what yeah. is, how, how do, do you see that move happen with that? Yeah, a lot. And and I, you know, you mentioned that the show gets 150,000 downloads a day. We'd, we'd probably be getting a million downloads a day after nine years if I wasn't, you know, this this crazy, you know, anarcho-libertarian, because it's just too much for some people. But I mean, over the years, what I found is I can't be untrue to who I am and what I know and what I believe. So I have to put out kind of that that pure message. I try to blend it with pragmatism, pragmatism, but absolutely, I've seen people move more and more uh, down the spectrum toward uh, closer and closer to voluntarism, anarchism, whatever you want to call it, as they become more self-sufficient, because you stop worrying about, well, if if the government's not there to get this done, how is it going to get done? And one of the ways I've, I've been trying to explain it lately is we had a, a discussion on a local group here where people were saying, it, I said something about, you know, with the property tax going up and up, and they want to cap the amount it can go up, kind of like uh, California did mm -hmm. many years ago. And they said, well, you know, if we don't have property taxes, how are we going to pay for everything we need uh, because this state doesn't have an income tax? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's look at that a little bit differently. Let's imagine that we were in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. where they have a higher sales tax, higher property tax, and they have a fairly high income tax. And you told the people in New Jersey, we should just get rid of the income tax. Well, they would tell you, well, how would we pay for everything? And mm -hmm. sitting here in Texas, we can look at that and go, well, that's, that's really stupid because somehow we have all of the things that we need to have in this state without that third form of taxation. And then if we look at New Hampshire, they only have one of those three forms of state taxation, and their property taxes are about what they are here in Texas. So, you know, when we look at it that way, government tends to provide what we call essential services. If you don't give them any money to do anything else, they manage to get that done. Right. But no matter how much money you give them, they're always strapped to get those essential services done. And that's just a game. It's a gimmick. It's like what you were talking about earlier, where you were talking about, you know, redoing uh, The Shining. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, I when I was teaching marketing to folks, there was a guy that did remixes of the movie Office Space. Okay. And he did one where it was like a slasher murder mystery. He did one where it was uh, like a, a mystery uh, cop documentary. And the other one was like a love story. Huh. Now, now, the interesting thing was they used the exact same footage, film, sound bites. They just changed the way it was presented. Right. That's all they did. They used everything else was the same. And each one would have sold that movie as being what it was. What I found to be most concerning, I guess, was that the slasher, thriller, murder thing, that would not have worked. I think the average sheep, as we call them, yes. that if they would have seen the trailer for the love story or they would have saw the, 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 the one for like the crime investigation, would not have actually seen anything wrong with it when they saw the actual movie. Ooh. And, and that is the mindset that we're dealing with with people. So I've actually figured out over the years that I, I just kind of take the politics and say, We'll do maybe that once or twice a month, and we'll put it over here, mm -hmm. and we're going to focus on self-sufficiency, self-reliance, independence, and personal liberty, and we're going to teach that, and that's going to gravitate people toward the concept of less and less government because, well, I guess another way to put it is what I've been saying lately. I've seen a lot of uh, contention going on between like our community and then the, the LP, which I mentioned earlier, you know, the official you know, right. Libertarian Party, and, and I kind of look at the LP now as this, it's a step stone. Right. It is a place for the person who just can't get their head around the fact that we could do this stuff without a state yet, 
but they know there's something wrong, and it gives them a place to move out of either the left or the right of the paradigm into a you know a place that they can sit for a little while and start to examine this stuff and let go of some of the conditioning. And I think that's what we have to do in this community is a better job of reaching out to people. And I don't care if they're on the left. I don't care if they're on the right. Um, I mean, if they're batshit crazy, if they are you know, completely immersed in the matrix, right. they're not alert at all to right. any other possibility. You just let that go. There's plenty of people that are. Right. But those people that are still in those entrenched positions, I think the, the biggest thing we do to harm ourselves is we start out bashing them over the head with a message like, well, my roads, my roads, right? Or something like that instead of just saying, hey, you know, like, are, are you prepared if, if, if systems of support fail? And, and like I said, as, as that person starts to take a walk in preparedness, the more prepared they become, the less they feel that they need somebody else to do it for them. And the more they want to hold other people accountable to the same standard, like I'll help you, but don't force me to help you. You've mm -hmm. got to do something for yourself. So I want to talk, I want to talk with you about the, the personal liberty aspect because I'm seeing something, you know, I think that this last election sparked a lot of people off and got a lot of people questioning things. I'm seeing some very weird sort of uh, and very vocal, strange things spring out of the what would I guess traditionally be the libertarian umbrella. We probably won't cover the this this stabbing in Portland, but looking into that was very strange. I think that that guy could probably be grouped in some of his views into the overall sort of uh, questioning libertarian, I don't know, prob uh, probably a little more of the right side. But I want to talk about this, this left-right, uh, I think it's a false dichotomy in some ways. Uh, it's certainly, it's real, right? There's no question yeah. that there are people who have differing aesthetic preferences, right? And that may, that's, that's basically how we choose to live our life. It's the clothes we choose to wear. It's the place we choose to live. It's the food we choose to eat. It's the people we choose to hang out with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Personal liberty, the whole idea behind personal liberty is that you've got the personal liberty to have whatever aesthetic preference you want. You have the personal liberty to choose which of those things you want. One thing that I, I, I want to sort of get your thoughts on, you know, you wearing a, a, a Bitcoin shirt and at the the same time, you know, you, you embody a lot of things. And I feel like in, in many ways I do too, not nearly as many actual physical things as you do. But as a software developer, one thing that I know is the lifestyle that you have and the lifestyle that is led by the guys who are out there on the forefront developing cryptocurrency and as software developers is considerably different. And I think that probably in terms of, uh, most of them are not, most of them are anarchists, but in terms of the two of you, if you were status, you know, your backgrounds, we'd probably say, uh, probably, they're probably a little left, you're probably a little right, still closer yeah. to the center, right? Not, not either way, but, and this, this is sort of what I wanted to get your thoughts on. The idea that someone who's coming from, let's say, backyard gardening, right? They're, they're living, let's say they're living somewhere in the Midwest, somewhere in the South, maybe in Texas. They think of themselves as maybe a little more conservative, but the, the government, the local government there is cracking down and, and zoning and whatever, not allowing them to do the things that they want to do, which is helping to develop the entire scene, new technology in that regard and everything. Uh, by the same token, we've got people developing software up in Silicon Valley who also identify themselves as voluntarists, as libertarians, as anarchists, and the government is cracking down on them in the same way. To me, it's two sides of the same Bitcoin, if you will. <laughs> but I want to get your thoughts on the idea of th those two groups of people. How do we start to, because you clearly, you clearly do identify on both ends, how do we start to bring those two together to realize we're all crypto savages, we're part of this same struggle, and we're, we're trying to get to the same place? How do we bridge that gap? There's a few things there. One of the first things that we need to do in this community is stop beating people about the head and shoulders who are 80% to where we are. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we make. We, I, I think it was one of your earlier episodes. I remember you played the uh, the the libertarian presidential uh, campaign right. uh, video for uh, Gary Johnson, and they show all this stuff about. No, it was, it was for uh, McAfee, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you know they showed, but at the end it showed this NASA 
you know, space shuttle launch. And even I, I was like, you know, it's like the one damn cool thing government's done. What a right. right. space S rocket in there. But it, it wasn't that big a deal to me because the message was, was very clear. And, and that message was designed to get people that are nowhere near where we are, but they're a little closer than they maybe were three weeks ago because something has gone on in their life to tell them, hey, you know, your side's not really any better than the other side, even though they don't want to admit it, and to drag them just a little bit in this direction, maybe get them into that stepping stone. And and, and what I saw online was just like this, this hatred come out of both sides of the voluntarist anarcho communities, like, you know, that statism and whatever. It's like, Good Lord. I bet you drive a car, you have electricity right. to your house, you know, you pay income tax on the money that you have to pay income tax. Like, we're all part of that system, whether we want to be or not. But I think the way you start to get people together is to, is to get them back to their true nature. And I'm going to say some things that might sound a little bit funny Go here ahead, at first. please. But uh, we, we, we talk about who we call them sheeple, and we say that they become sheep, right? And I think it's just because sheep rhymes with peep, so we get mm -hmm. sheeple. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what, what, what we really have is that human beings are supposed to be a lot more like a pig than a cow, okay? Hear me out on this. Please. Um, the pig will go feral in an instant. If you put a, a pig on a great big ranch with fencing all around it designed to keep a pig in, that pig will push on every piece of that fence until it finds one little hole. And if it finds one little hole, it will get out. If it's in a greater contained area, at least it got a little bit more freedom, a little bit more liberty. And if it gets all the way out, it will start breeding with other pigs. It will go completely feral. And by the next generation, it'll start to look like a wild pig again. Hmm. And it'll live the way a pig is supposed to live. And you cannot domesticate a pig. You can train a pig to think it's domesticated, but give it this much of a chance, hmm. it'll run away. If you keep cattle on a ranch and you have your barbed wire and your electric fencing and all to keep the cattle in, and you let that infrastructure degrade, but there's been generations of those cows on that ranch, they won't leave. They'll hmm. accept those boundaries even when they're decayed and, and broken down and, and, and what have you. And that cow will sit there. And if it's a dairy cow, when you milk it, it actually seems to enjoy being milked. Hmm. This is how human beings are behaving. And what it is, is it's not really, they know it's wrong. They don't want to do this, but it's a form of defeatism. Like, I've heard people say, well, there's no reason for me to build a business because they're just going to tax it. Or I'm not going to buy property because then I'm going to have to pay property tax. And it's like, geez, you know, if somebody put you in this this prison, like a, like a big fenced-in area, and you saw a place you could get through that fence and get a little bit more freedom, would you go through the hole or not? And I think a lot of these people wouldn't anymore. But once we get out to that next layer of independence, then we start t testing the boundaries. Where's our, next, where's our next breach point? How do we get a little further out? And what you find, I don't care if you come from a left view or a right view, the, the further and further you get out in that spectrum of liberty, the less these little differences really affect us. Because what you know, what the the left will say about the right leaning person that wants to cut educational expenses is you don't care about children. You don't want children to be educated. Mm -hmm. well, of course they do. That's why they're the number one group of people in the world that do homeschooling. That's right. Right? That's like right. if they didn't care about the education of children, they wouldn't make that extra effort with their own children. Right. You know, so clearly they care about educating children, but they're also looking at a system that's spending more money in public schools in some states than people spend to go to college. With, with failure rates that are 50, 60 percent in some of the district. That's right. And it, it's not fixing the problem. So the problem really isn't that they disagree at all. They've been led to believe that only the state can provide the solution. And therefore, since the solution is not in their hands anymore, and there's a third party that's going to that's gonna integrate that solution, now we have to argue about how that gets done. Or if we take the solution back into our own hands, then I'm like, well, this is my solution for educating children. Well, this is my solution for educating children. Well, maybe we can learn something from each other. Maybe we can incorporate each other's ideas. Maybe I don't like some of what you're doing, so I won't do that. Maybe you don't like some of what I'm doing, so you won't do that. But since we have the freedom to make those determinations for ourselves, all of a sudden this massive divide, and you can go, it's not education alone. You can go through this in every single place sure. that we seem to have great deals of differences with each other. It amazed me during the whole, you know, the, the gay marriage thing. I'm like, this is the most, I, I cannot believe that a nation of 300 million people in the most prosperous nation on the planet are arguing with right. each other about whether two dudes or two chicks can get married. Right. This so, has to be the dumbest waste of time and energy I've ever seen in my life. The only reason that was a debate is because the state was involved in marriage. That's right. 
Absolutely. And what I said, when you took either side and said, what if the state wasn't involved in marriage? Yeah, and you no, had to yeah. work on it. It wasn't easy. You know, you had to actually get them to think about it. But what, what got me most was when you would tell, like, the devout Christian, do you know if you're in a state-based marriage, you're in a polygamous relationship, and that's against your religion? Speak and their that. eyes. Would, how, does, how does that work? Okay, because the marriage is supposed to be between you and your other partner yeah. and, your, and your God. Oh, that's now it. the state's involved. That's, well, the Third state's party. now involved. Now, right. check it out. This is what's really messed up. <laughs> we get married in Texas, and we move to Florida. Without our permission, the state of Florida alters the existing contract we had with the state of Texas. No other institution in the oh, world works right. that way. That's right. Like, if I incorporate in Texas and I move to Florida, my articles of incorporation don't change. That's right. Right. So clearly, if, if your contract can be amended without your approval by the state, you're in a three way marriage. Mm -hmm. And then you just walk away from that one because that 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 brain has to process that for a while. And as soon as they start to come up with the concept of, well, maybe the state shouldn't be involved in marriage. Well, I don't really care what, what you know, you know, because Adam and Steve, you know, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That is not a logical argument. <laughs> that is not a well thought out logical argument. It really isn't. And and it's amazing how as soon as you start to pull people out of that kind of point where they're wrapped up into this belief that the state is the solution, that the differences just don't matter as much anymore. And it it is the funny part about it is is that these same individuals do recognize that the state screws just about everything up. Like the state, there's no question that just about everything that the state touches is a piece of shit. Like all you have to do is go to the DMV and it's like, dude, how hard is it to change a car registration? Like, why am I sitting here for five hours? Like, how hard is it to take my picture? This is ridiculous, you know what I mean? People know these things. Like they, they, they understand. I mean, the fact that you're driving down the street and you look in your rear view mirror and there's cop lights going, I don't care how much of a law abiding citizen you are, your heart drops to the pit of your stomach. There's no, the fact that that happens, it tells you everything you need to know about what you really believe about the state. <laughs> and that's in every single thing that they do because it's never, you've never, no one has ever had a good interaction with the state, ever. No one's had no. a good government interaction. I mean, you you are now an anarchist, but at one at one point, I mean, you were even gonna you were even gonna run for office, but something changed. I ran for office. I ran for the Texas State House as a libertarian candidate, and uh, I was in such a dominant Republican district mm. that the highest voter uh, vote win for a Democrat in that district was nine percent. <laughs> And I got 16% as a libertarian. Oh, that's a really high for a libertarian, and actually. That's hugely high. I mean, that's, you know, and we did it by going door to door, basically. And, um, but as soon as I started to actually get on the board, uh, I was reported by the Republican for not uh, doing proper reporting of all my fundraising, which I, I had no fundraising. Right. I didn't do any fundraising. I didn't take any money. I didn't put any money into the campaign, not even my own. So there was nothing to report. But apparently you still have to fill out an extra report that says there's nothing to report. So they fined me $500. And, you know, it gave me a real quick look at how, how the political spectrum worked. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, I don't really want anything to do with this anymore because this is a meaningless position that pays $800 a month, mm -hmm. right? It, overall, like one state rep in Texas is not going to get anything done. And if they'll do this over something like that, what do they do over, you know, a, a Senate seat, an actual that's right. Senate seat? That's, well, they, and they might kill you. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> if, if you want to completely get somebody off the political spectrum forever when they say, well, we can vote the right people in. There's a great little website out there. A guy that was on my show years ago put together called Defining the Machine. Mm. He ran for uh, a representative in somewhere in New Hampshire as part of a free state project. Didn't win. But he learned about something called the party due system. Yes. So the party yes. due system works like this. Then you you run for a you know uh, state rep of uh, or, or a federal rep for Nevada, and you win, and you make all these promises to people about what you're going to do, and you mean it. You're Vin Armani. You're not bullshitting people. You mean what you say. Somebody's convinced you to run for office, even though you don't believe in it, and right. you're going to do the best you can. So you show up for your freshman congressman briefing. Guy comes out to you with a book, says like this: Here you go. 
Here you go, man. Take this book and go over there. Start making phone calls out of this book right here. When you earn enough money for the party to pay off the debt that you incurred running for office where we supported you, then you can do something. Now, not much, but you can do something. And it's like a quarter million dollars. And even if they opposed you and slammed you because you were a Tea Party Republican right, or whatever, right. you still have to pay this bill. Well, now I'd like to submit uh, some legislation. Oh, great. There's a price list right over here. And, and anything you want to do, co-sponsor a bill, sponsor a bill, all of it's on that price list. It's completely legal, by the way. And you can go, and as long as you get that done, then you can do all these other things. Otherwise, all you can do is show up and vote yes or no. That's it. So with that, that one system in place, if you go there completely unbeholden to anybody, mm -hmm. you must be become beholden to do anything. And, of course, they give you the soft marketing layups, right? They give you sure, the people that are sure, just going to give sure. you money sure. because they know that, well, I wrote you a check now. Sure. Check now. I, so what I, what I do want to discuss, um, I, I, want to talk, I want to talk a little bit more about, the, about your views when it comes to voluntarism for those people who are not – basically who are not thinking that they're going to be completely self-sufficient, right? That they can be in, a, in sort of a bubble where they can provide for themselves and their family, yet feel that they want, one, the state to be removed. If they're going to take the path that's the, the agorist, the agorist path, what would you say is the, the one or two things that someone can start with that are those things that will help to take the state out of their life where they can really start to feel like, okay, I can take care of myself. This is a voluntary action on my part. Something I think is really important. Almost no one is 100% self-sufficient or mm -hmm. self-reliant. Mm -hmm. And let's just real quick how we measure those anyway. Self-sufficiency, we, we measure in percentage. And, and what I mean by that is if I can produce half of my own electricity, uh, through solar, wind, whatever, then I'm 50% self-sufficient when it comes to my energy needs or my at least my energy desires. Self-reliance we measure in time. So if I have enough batteries to keep lights on for a week, then I have a week's worth of self-reliance for lighting. And when you start breaking it down that way, it gets, it gets really quick, logical, that you're just not going to be 100% self-sufficient and self-reliant. Human beings are not meant to be. You know, earlier I was comparing human beings like we're supposed to be like feral hogs. Well, hogs rely on each other a great deal. They form groups. They form tribe. Basically, you know, we, we call them saunders, I think, but they're, they're really tribal. And, you know, there, there's someone that's a leader. There's someone that's maybe a good scout, et cetera. Maybe more like a wolf pack is a way to look at it. And, and we're going to have to rely on each other. So, so you don't have to be 100% self-sufficient. When I'm talking about, when I talk about, you know, basic preparedness is just being able to take care of your needs during an acute emergency and provide some of your own things on an ongoing basis so that you have a better quality of life. You put more money back in your pocket. And I think what people need to do is figure out, well, how am I going to develop my self-reliance and self-sufficiency? Because some of it can be done with stuff and some can be done with lifestyle choices. But frankly, some of it can just be done with freaking money. I mean, if you have something that you're able to do that takes you out of the world of employment and puts you into the world of entrepreneurship, whether it be something in a counter market, a gorgeous type thing, or an above board business, or something that blends the lines between the two, or something that's totally above board, and then maybe there's some agorism going on over here, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. then money solves a lot of problems. I think it was Fernando Aguirre that said a Glock, a passport, and 10 grand solves most problems you'll ever have in your this life. Is true. And uh, so, like, just figure out, like, what is it that you really want to do? Because, you know, I want to say growing your own food. But what if you hate gardening? Well, don't freaking do that then, right? right? Find somebody locally that you can become, you know, kind of their patron where you're buying your food from them. It's a local producer. Okay. That scared me. I thought we were going to walk Yeah, I know. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, right? But anyway, like, find someone that you can deal with locally. Like, I have a small property. I can't grow my own cattle here. It would just be a dumb thing to do. The property can't handle it. Right. But I just bought a half a cow from the guy down the road. I paid half of it you know, for the, what I would pay in a grocery store. So you start reaching out to people and start looking for 
and interdependence of the people in your local area or in your community. You know, we have a, a business directory on my site, and I always tell people when you're going to do business, go see if someone in our community does that thing first. Hmm. I think, uh, like, one of the things I know you're excited about this too that I'm totally stoked about is Swarm City. Oh, man, I'm super excited about it. Oh, the that's going to be great for you, man, to be able to sell stuff on in, in through their economy is going to be sick. Well, I, I, I just would look forward to being able to actually get an Uber-like ride right. downtown and, and right. have a couple old fashions down at the Bird Cafe and get home without having the lights come on behind right. me. Because, you know, Uber doesn't come here. But I bet you, I bet you somewhere oh, hashtag need ride is going to get someone to show up here, absolutely. right? So, I mean, that is opening. And I think, like, there's some levels where I think people need to have a little bit of patience, hmm. right? We are at a point where we're evolving faster technologically than any time in history and it's still not quick enough for some people hmm. i think boardwalks do out the 15th of june right. people are like man I, why can't they just do that now well maybe because they want it to work right you know right. <laughs> right so like we need to be a little bit patient and we need to be planning how we're going to engage with this this new reality this new world i had people emailing me going what are you doing about bitcoin this week i'm like what do you want me to do about it? right well it's crashing i don't know it's up like a thousand dollars for the year i don't I don't, <laughs> right, it's at I, the same I, place that it went. Uh, last Monday, we were like, wow, Bitcoin's yeah. at 2200 Today, yeah. Bitcoin's at $2,200. Like, I, <laughs> I, yeah, it's crashed from this unrealistic high. Well, exactly. Why do you sell there? Because, well, the majority of my holdings in Bitcoin anyway are in Coinbase, and right. then I would have tax implications, right. and that's, that's, that's forever money as far as right. I'm concerned. I'm playing the long term with that. Uh, if you want to do crypto trading, you know, that's, that's a good a legitimate you know, thing for people to do. I'm not going to sit around all day watching things and trying to time markets. I, I play long-term trends, you know. But I, I think that what whatever it is that, that you actually are excited about, if you want to learn self-defense and that's exciting for you, go out and do that. I think that's a huge thing because it then it, it's another one of those pillars. I mean, basically, you can look at your survival needs, right? You got food, you got water, you got shelter, you got energy. Uh, and you got health, sanitation, you got security. Those are actually your six. I added health and sanitation because, well, you don't think you need it till you don't have it. Right. Uh, when you when your toilet don't flush for a week, you got a problem if you don't have a plan. But but out of those six, and it probably won't be health and sanitation will be at the top of your list. Which one of them excites you most? And go do something, anything outside of the box that you've had your life in with that, because what it does is it throws this mental switch. And what people always come to someone like me with is, well, what is your five steps or whatever. See, to me, that's bullshit, because if I give you five steps and you don't really like any of them or you only like one of them, right. you're going to do the one you like and then you're going to quit. And what we need to be doing is empowering people with the concept of, like, here's the things you actually need to be worried about. Like, what happens on the other side of the world? We can examine that. We can learn from it. But it really doesn't change the temperature of the water in your pool. Right. It just mm -hmm. doesn't. So you need to be focused on the things that you actually can influence. And there's people like you and I, we'll get online and we can influence a lot more people through the, the new, you know, the new outlets and media as far as their thinking. But just like the examination you did of what's going on in Manchester and man, you got into that to the point where I had to go get a bottle of meat out. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like it was the one, it was the first one of these I finally let go and just said, I know it's bullshit, but I'm just not going to work. I'm just right, going to do right, something yep, up. And yep. I started like, damn it. Uh, you know, the, in the end, we can learn from these things, but we're not going to change those things. That's right. What we can change is the actions individuals take. And there's, there, I, I personally believe we're going to reach a point of critical mass where it seems like a little bitty thing that you're changing one or two people's opinions and minds and directions but there's going to be a point where that grows to such a high level that it's going to it's going to you know overwhelm the system. Hmm. And, and the key with that is when that system gets overwhelmed, I don't see it being like you know the streets are burning and the things that most people in my niche talk about. But I do see a lot of people that aren't prepared for the new reality getting hurt. That's right. And I think you need to be just in some way prepared for a different world. I, you know, I, I like that. I, I, there's there's something there is something there I think that's very important for for people to it's over here by the way Christian <laughs> he's look, he's looking for his he's looking for the mouse I'm 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 click on me Christian for for Christ's sake <laughs> so no there's something <laughs> no I I think that there's a that there's a, a very good axiom there is that 
you know, all these people who are saying that, that we need to be reliant on the state, I think what often gets lost in the mix there is that the state is made up of people. Like at the end of the day, you're still reliant on other people in your community, state, nation, globally, etc. Whether you're dealing with the state or you're not dealing with the state. And every single person, like people who really enjoy, who really have a green thumb and really enjoy growing food, if they have personal liberty, they're gonna grow food. The people who really enjoy doing software development, building cars, building homes, even building roads, because there are quite a few people out there who that is actually their passion is building Private roads. companies can build the most technologically advanced vehicles that ever existed, but God help us, could they ever build a flat thing? Can't build, can't, can't build something for those for those uh, cars to drive on, right? So I mean, it's it's like there'd be a McDonald's here and a mall there and your house there, and we would all just sit around going. Yeah, I wish we wish you could go to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could get there, but we. Or can't. maybe we wouldn't even need roads. But I guess my point is that <laughs> it, I think what gets lost is when liberty is increased and the people who truly love to do things do are allowed to do them. They're going to be done a lot better, a lot faster, and a lot cheaper. And I think that what a lot of people forget is that like there was a time where all of these things that we have, nobody was doing them. The whole reason, the whole reason why people started doing these things was because they found them interesting. And the reason why they stuck at them long enough to make them into things like farming was because they were passionate about them. It's not like that passion vanishes when you add exponentially more people. The passion only increases. The number of people who love being doctors is more. The people who love growing food is more. The people who love building cars is more. Like all of these things is just more. And I think that's what the state does nothing but rip that passion out from people. Well, and I, I think that in our community too, we have to be careful. There's this segment of it that I do think comes from the left mindset. And again, I'm not putting anybody down, but I mean, I was listening to, uh, it was on the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. Mm -hmm. I think it was the Tatiana show or something mm -hmm. like that. And they were talking about voluntarism and anarchism. And these people all called themselves anarchists. But first of all, I think their timeline was a little unrealistic. Like, well, what are we going to do when there is no state? Like, well, you know what? Don't worry about That's that. It's a long be ways away. <laughs> seven generations is the way yeah. we need to be thinking about yeah. this and chipping away at it right. a little at a time. But then they were like, well, how do we make sure everybody has an equal stake? Well, you don't make you sure don't. everybody has an equal stake. Yeah. In fact, this is the scary thing. The more liberty you have, the greater inequality you will have. Oh, 100%. And that's good, but it sounds like you've been conditioned to believe that's a bad thing. But the reality is the person that can work harder or will work longer or will work smarter or is just smarter than you or better than you or uh, has more talent than you, they're going to – if you give them more liberty, they're going to do more of that shit. And, and the disparity between them and somebody else is going to grow, but it doesn't have to grow, and it won't grow in all things. For instance, I don't give a damn how hard I would have tried. I could have never competed with Michael Jordan as a basketball player. Right. Just I'm a five foot eleven inch white dude that can't jump. I mean, it just it ain't gonna. And I'm a Ukrainian. I'm built like a freaking you know like a small house or something. I'm not that kind of kind of guy. But but I have a, a feeling I'm probably a better podcaster than Michael Jordan ever could be. There you go. <laughs> Right, so so we each, even when there's there's like this seemingly insurmountable disparity between capabilities and abilities, um, everybody has something they can be wonderful at, and what we have is a huge, I mean, millions of people that don't know that anymore. They don't know there's something they can be wonderful about. They don't understand when you say like there would be more of these things that people are doing because they're doing because they're passionate. Because most Americans don't have a job they're passionate about doing. That's right. If if they won the lottery, they would quit tomorrow. Right. If, if somebody handed me $50 million, well, the first thing I would do is get a damn good uh, attorney to structure it so the government can take as little bit as possible. And then I would probably take a few weeks of vacation. And then I would come back and say, how can I use this to do more of what I'm already doing? That's, that's same, for American, same for me. Same for me. Same Exact right? same for me. The average American, if they want $50 million, would first call up their boss and, and, and say a bunch of cuss words to them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you suck for employing me for the past 20 years and putting food on my table, you ass. And hang the phone up, and then they would go out and blow a shitload of it, and most of them end up broke in five to ten years. Right. So when you're telling them, well, people will still do the things that they're passionate about, you're almost speaking a foreign language to them. So that's why I always think the first thing to do is to get them to figure out what the hell they're passionate about 
and get them to go do that. And it, it's it's actually so simple. The minute that switch flips in somebody's head, I've seen it so many times. I've had so many people on my audience over the years say, one day I was listening to you, and you said if I wanted to start a business, I could, so I did. Hmm. Well, shit, that's all it took? Like, because I'll say that more if that's if that's what you need right. to hear, right? right? I'll, but it's but what, what it really was is that person was actually at a point where they just needed somebody to say it. I just happened to be the somebody they were listening to. And we need to get more people to that point and just push them over and then let them go. And, and you got to understand, failure is okay. I failed my ass off, you know, in, in my beginnings as an entrepreneur. And then I became very, very successful because I failed. And I learned an awful lot by failing. I learned about, you know, who you could trust and who you couldn't trust For just sure. on instinct For alone. Sure. You know, there were people like, oh, this guy's a good guy. You know, he's a slug, right. right? And it got to a point where like, okay, even if I don't think you're a slug, I'm going to put these fail safes in. So if you are a slug, you don't cost me money. And, and, and things like that, you know, took me to where I became very, very successful in the, the corporate space. And then one day I looked around and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, where people would be going, man, you got it made. You just keep doing this for another 10 years, and, you know, I, like, I don't want to do this anymore. So I'm going to go start a podcast in my car right? with this little piece of shit Sony thing because that's what I have right now, and I don't know how to do this, so I'll figure it out. And then that becomes a successful business. And it's because of those past failures and successes that I knew when, like, well, if I want to go do this, then, then I can just go do that. And and that's, that's where we have to start. I think entrepreneurship uh, or, you know, it doesn't always have to be – Full bore entrepreneurship. It can be things like I don't really consider you an entrepreneur if you drive for Uber, right? And, and when Swarm City launches, if you're doing Need a Ride or whatever, I won't really consider you an entrepreneur. But it's a hell of a side hustle, and it, it causes sure. that same switch to flip. And, and eventually, that's the person who figures out, well, here's how I can structure this, or here's how I can do these things in my life. Then they become perceptive to this message that we don't need the state to do these things, right? And it, it almost takes that to make that happen. And what I find is a lot of people that come into our space that don't ever do that, they're the ones going, well, how do we make sure everybody gets an equal stake? Right. And, and it's that last little bit of fear that they're clinging on to going like, oh, we, we, you know, everybody has to be taken care of. Because the reality is we created a completely free stateless society. We took all the money in the world and divided it by whatever number of billion people are alive at the time and gave everybody an equal stake. In one year, it would look an awful lot like it does today. Well, I mean, look, anybody who's played Monopoly knows how that works, right? You start out, you start out with an equal amount and within, a, there's no state involved. It's free, it's free, the free market. Yeah, you can, shit, shit happens. But the wonderful part about it is that you have the opportunity along the way, unlike Monopoly, is that you get to choose. And if people start going out and doing the things that they're passionate about, one, it starts becoming a lot less necessary that everyone has an equal stake. And two, I think we actually start to appreciate, you know, look, if the, the guy who invented the, the, you know, the chip in the smartphone that does 4G, let him live in a fucking mansion because I could yeah, do it. Totally you know what cool. I mean? Like, yeah. I need it. He did great. I get it for super cheap. Let him live in a mansion. I'm cool with that. Like, I'm totally good. You yeah, know? I'm running around shooting 1080 video out of an iPhone and using no editing software cool. to, to put this shit. Yeah, like, he has totally earned his money. He's I'm, good, I'm, man. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. want him to be equal to me. I don't want him to be equal because I want him to keep, to have, to, to be able to keep doing that to, for there to be some motivation. I mean, look, you, you should be doing something, and I'm sure that that particular guy, and like you, and like myself, like, it's not that we're doing what we're doing for money, right? If we do it and we're good at it, then obviously, then there's, there's value that we're giving. And if we're allowed, then the value comes. I, and, and maybe, I think we're getting close to, even though we had that little crash, I think we're getting, we're getting a little close to, to time. Could be, it's, time flies, dude. Like, I, I, love, uh, I love your wisdom because you have a lot of it. Is there anything else that you want to end off with? I feel like we've covered a lot, but I know that we probably could do this for another hour, and we probably should at some point. Is there anything you want to leave off with just that's, that's current, that's been going through your head lately? You know, I, I, I think the, the, the big thing that I would just – constantly reiterate to people is the, the concept of following their passion and i think a lot of people the reason that that's almost like a foreign language is not only are you not doing it you don't even know what it is hmm. you haven't taken the time for self-evaluation to figure out what it really is that you want in life and i think a lot of that is because 
we've been conditioned by the system itself, the, primarily the government school system and the and the the system that is corporate marketing to believe there's certain things we're supposed to want and th- certain things that we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And if you have these things and have this car, then the good looking chicks will want to be with you or whatever. And, and I think you need to be, be willing to just for, you know, a day at least, and really more like take a weekend somewhere away and, and, and say the hell with all of this and just start asking your, yourself questions like, when was the last time in my life I was really happy and what mm-hmm. was I doing? I mean, that doesn't sound like survivalism, but damn it, it's survivalism. It really is because that answer is going to be very important. And then the question becomes, well, how do I how do I continue to do more things like that in my life and earn a living so that I can actually live the way that I want to live? Hmm. And and it's something that people have been highly conditioned not to do, uh, to not question the status quo, to not buck the system. And it's almost hardwired. And I think if you if you talk to wealthy people. They have different vocabulary. And I wouldn't consider myself rich, but I would consider myself wealthy. I don't worry about paying my bills, and I haven't for a long time. And I do try to stay in touch with the fact that not everybody lives that way. And every once in a while, I I take, you know, gratitude for what you have, I think, is important, too, is what I'm saying. But you you, you get to the point where you you figure out what you want to do, and you're going to go try to get it done. And then don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fail with it. Just, I mean, so what? Then you have the same thing you have now. You tried something, and, and I guarantee you're going to have more because you're going to learn something from that. And, and you, you you start using, like I said, a different vocabulary where the person that has no money will always say when they look at something they would like to buy that they can't afford, I wish I could afford it, or why can't I afford that? Where when I look at something, I, I immediately go, I don't care whether I think I can afford it or not. I know I can. There's some way that can be done. Mm. And my, my question is then how can I afford that or how can I make that work? Or how can I have – I don't have to buy it. How can I have access to that? How can sure. I have sure. – you know, how can I gain access to that? And then that will always lead you to a solution. And then you say to yourself, well, do I want it that bad? Mm. Am I willing to make those sacrifices or do those things or give these other things up in my life? And a lot of times you'll find you'll say, no, I'm not. I, I, I don't want it that bad. And you know what that removes from your life? Like the, the most toxic thing in the lives of most people that makes mm. all this shit possible by the people in power? It removes envy. There you go. Envy is the freaking tool that the establishment uses to control you. Envy of – you just pick any other segment of society that has something you don't, mm. and you look at all of the marketing in the world, all of the messaging in the world, all the political commentary in the world. It's all built on freaking envy. Hmm. And if you take envy out of your life. And you say, you know, like you were saying earlier, the guy that made the chip for the smartphone, I don't give a shit if he has two yachts, right. you know, and a fleet of naked chicks driving him around. I don't care. Right. That's his business. And and my business largely functions because of what he did. Right. What does Elon Musk have? I don't give a shit. The exactly. man can have anything you want. Do you know how many people have a business today because of freaking PayPal? That's right. I mean, the, the concept that the rich people are the problem is the stupidest thing because you show me a rich person who got there by doing something. I'm not talking about trust fund babies or whatever. Right. You show me somebody that got there by doing something, and I will show you thousands of entrepreneurs that are profiting because of what they did. That's right. Bill Gates. You know That's what? Right. How many people are in the business of selling, building, designing, uh, and, and, and customizing PCs? Because well, he dude, said that. We're, was- we're, our, our, we're running that, that just crashed, by the way, but that's, that's a Windows machine. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. How, many, how many businesses exist? because of windows dude like holy crap like how much of everything that we have is made possible because of windows like let him be the richest person if who who deserves to be the richest person in the world like why why do i deserve to have the type of money that he has have i done any of that is you know what i mean like well and here's the other way to look at let's say we took the 50 wealthiest americans out there we took every penny they had we threw it at the, 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 the governmental budget, right. and, and every surplus that was left we gave us a refund to taxpayers. In one year, you'd have absolutely nothing to show for it. That's right. You, you'd have nothing. So what's the point of even worrying about it? That's and right. Well, why should people have so much when some have so little? Well, why don't you start asking the real question, which is, what can we do to help others that have so little have more? There you go. And that is not going to be taken away from the guy that built, you know, the best graphics, you know, chip or whatever. It's going to be how do we get out of their damn way and how like the most insidious thing that we've done other than the envy thing is the whole the entire governmental welfare system is a trap. Like a person goes in there, sure. you know, they can't get out. And, and it's like when I said it was like a, a hammock, 
you just stayed in? Well, it's actually worse because when you get out, at least you can get out of the hammock. You might fall and bust your ass, but you get out, right? But like when you try to get out of the welfare hammock, there's literally a bureaucrat up there going, Push you, you don't yeah. get back. I'm mm -hmm. gonna punch you in the face. I'm gonna take what you have, right? And you're gonna have nothing now, and you know you're not gonna get back on. That's right. So like, it's not just it's hard to get out. In some ways, it doesn't. Like, why would you? Mm -hmm. Why would you? Mm -hmm. That's how people feel. And again, man, removing envy, follow your passion, and and, and just go out and try something, man. I love it. I love it. Words, words of wisdom, words to live by. We're gonna have to do this again, man, because I well, always, I always feel like we kept this. Yes. right? You don't do that. None of this is gonna matter. <laughs> um, and you mentioned the word false dichotomy earlier, right? If you stick false dichotomy in our search box, you'll find lots of. There you go. Yes, absolutely. The survival podcast.com every five days a week and every single show is fire guys so like it's definitely worth checking out you will become a much better person and also a much more secure person just mentally and knowing that yeah there is a possibility for me to take care of myself so jack spirko man great having you on thanks for uh sticking through the technical difficulties we'll get this thing edited so the archive is 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 nice and crisp <laughs> all right brother thank you so much for being on and we'll see you again soon thank you man right. thank you christian so christian another great episode with jack spearco unfortunately a little glitch but oh, the people okay. who are watching this in the archive will not see that we didn't get to our two other stories um the phoenix stabbing mm -hmm. and Bitcoin, although we did discuss a little bit the, the basic mm -hmm. nature of Bitcoin, but I think we covered a lot today. Yeah, great stuff. And I think that we are starting to get to what is the core. And I'm going to stay on this because I think we've I think we've hit a vein of gold here. Mm -hmm. This new culture, a new way of thinking, a new way of being and a way that you can actually be right. And that the people who are here who are watching are already there. Like people are like, what? I don't understand. How do you not have more viewers to your show? But the people who are asking that are crypto savages. They're yeah. people who are already here. You gotta just wait a little while. Our culture is growing. It's, mm -hmm. it's coming. We're, we're patient here. We know where this thing is going. We see where it's going. So Absolutely. everybody else be patient, but we're gonna, keep, we're gonna keep doing our thing. Thank you for today, dude. Awesome, uh, thank you. Great show. Great show. Great show. Great show. Let me say goodbye to the people. So we covered a lot today. Uh, we covered but we did we only covered a third of what we actually had to cover and yet it felt like a really full show i want to thank you guys for being here i want to thank my guest jack spirico definitely we'll have him back it's always a pleasure i want to of course thank my co-host and producer christian rays uh who's been doing a fantastic job for 31 weeks now seems like seems like just yesterday that we started uh but we're far from done and we're going to be back again next monday at 10 a.m Pacific time. If you want to catch this archive, you can do so on iTunes and Stitcher. That's for the audio podcast. If you want to check us out in video, it's vinarmani.com. Uh, excuse me. You could do vinarmani.com. YouTube.com slash vinarmani uh, or activist, uh, YouTube.com slash activist post. It's getting too hot, man. I'm having a tough time. So I'm going to go and cool down. And uh, until we see you next time, stay free.